Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Weir. I am the program chair for the Healthcare Administration Program here at Marion University. We are very pleased to present to you a panel discussion of topics regarding the healthcare reform. We are even happier to have twisted the arm of our keynote speaker last night, Dr. Kevin Thickinger, and he will be acting as the panel moderator. Uh, to his left is Brett McKittrick, and also Bob Samando, who are from Samando and Prentice, which is a human resources law firm in Waukesha. To their left is Dr. Greta Kostak, who is our one of our faculty professors in the School of Nursing. And then to her left is Steve Brenton, who we're very fortunate to have here today, who is the Wisconsin uh, Hospital Association president. And to his left is Stephanie Harrison, who is the president of the Wisconsin Primary Health Center Association. So with no further ado, we'll go into the process for the panel to introduce themselves and talk a few minutes about the healthcare reform, and then Dr. Fickinger will do his panel moderating. Dr. Fickinger. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here this morning and to have the opportunity to have this panel uh, and to participate. And uh, uh, we've already decided that we're going to try to create some controversy, so that's always good. We'll wake everybody up this morning. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask each of the panel members to sort of introduce themselves, but uh, more importantly to sort of start off with a question. Which is last night when we, uh, when I made my presentation, we talked about a lot of the issues that are affecting healthcare, and um, and then this morning we had a discussion uh, with the students about uh, all the changes that are going on in healthcare. So I'd like to start off with the panel, uh, with each of them maybe giving their perspective on what they feel, given all the things that are going on in healthcare and all the policy issues that we're having discussions about, both at the state level, local level, and federal level. What do you think is the most pressing issue that hasn't been addressed, that really must be addressed if we're going to move the healthcare system forward in a way that benefits society? So uh, we'll just start to go down the line here. So uh, Brett, why don't we start with you? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, my name is Brett McKittrick, and I'm primarily an employee benefits attorney. Uh, Bob and I work at a law firm that represents employers. So how we're involved with this is for the last year, we've been going around trying to counsel our clients and get the word out about what is known and then what are some questions that they as employers and plan sponsors should be asking with regard to some of the changes coming out around uh, surrounding this health reform. Changes that affect both employers, enabling them to provide good employee benefits for their employees and from the employee side, what they need to do and some of the decisions that they'll have to make surrounding their own uh, future in healthcare. Um, you know, probably the most important thing that, that, you know, we're hearing a lot about, is this going to take effect when? What's going to happen in 2014? We know what went down a year ago, but is that going to take hold? There's political sides to this, uh, and, and, you know, where Congress is at now versus where the executive branch is at now. What are things going to look like? Um, what I would like to see addressed a little more, as, uh, as opposed to maybe focusing so much on these gray areas or on these unknowns, and this can be done from both the industry side and on the employer side, what I would like to see addressed a little more from the industry and employers is how can we make health care plans better, all right? We're going to have to do some things, whether we like it or not, as a result of this health care reform. And as Health and Human Services and the Department of Labor and the IRS, the three big agencies and departments charged with implementing, implementing regulations, what can the employers do proactively and what can even providers do proactively, but certainly the insurance industry do proactively, to work on providing better care at a more cost-effective, in a more cost-effective manner? Without a doubt, however this ends up shaping up in 2014, it's not going to be cheap. There's no promise that health care being provided will be inexpensive. That's something that I think has been lost as well. 
And so what I would like to see the industry and employers focus on are other creative ways. We all have heard about wellness programs and wellness plans and consumer-driven healthcare and having employees and participants take a more active role in their own healthcare decisions from, a, from, a, from an insurance standpoint or a, a provider standpoint. We would like to see the employers and the insurance company help them do that. And one way of doing that is working within the laws that we know as of now, not focusing on these gray areas, but working within the constraints that we know of as now to provide better insurance products and look at doing so in a more effective manner from a cost standpoint. Whether that means providing incentives for people to um, get checkups more often, to join um, uh, gyms, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, programs that may target a specific ailment or condition, high blood pressure, obesity, smoking, things of that nature, things that are proven, have proven in the past to drive up healthcare costs. Let's focus on that a little bit more. The trend was going there before health reform. And I see how, while the trend is still there, how sometimes this, uh, the health reform has, has maybe caused a little bit of a stopping point or a standstill in the industry. Because everyone's so worried about what's going to happen in 2014. What do we have to do now? And we're not sure entirely. But the industry can still focus on what's probably best for the participants from a co coverage standpoint and from a cost-effective standpoint. So Bob, what, what's your perspective? <clears throat> a couple different things. Uh, first of all, the, we're not here today to talk about you know, doom and gloom and prognosticating the end of the world here. Um, what we're really talking about from our perspective as employer advocates is to identify what the challenges are and how we're going to address health care and compensation issues in the years to come. Uh, my personal feeling is that the Health Care Reform Act was an overreaction. Uh, that, in fact, we, we lost perspective, as Brett uh, indicated. We were moving towards a means of trying to control cost. The Health Reform Act, the desire really was to create availability. It didn't address the cost issue. And the cost issue is something that's gonna have to come down sooner or later. What I see the bill from my perspective is impacting, is that for large employers, the you know, thousand plus employee organizations, the Health Reform Act is an annoyance. It's gonna make people you know, do additional paperwork, it's gonna you know, involve additional uh, cost allocations, but at the end of the day, it's not really a big deal. It's an annoyance. For the small employers, the under 10s, uh, this is really a, a non-issue. Because what we're really talking about, an employer with 10 or fewer employees, you're talking about a family-owned business, for the most part. Something where they had individual policies covering the two or three key employees, that there may have been a number of part-time employees working for the employer, and that's it. This law impacts the middle class. That's what this is all about. That's the grouping that's gonna see the escalation in costs. Because they're the group that doesn't have the availability of self-insuring the benefit, they're gonna be out there looking for insured products to make sure that their people have coverage. You're gonna see a change in the composition of workplaces where before employers had a, a number of full-time employees, they're gonna to have to make a decision as to whether full-time employment is really in the best interest of their business is bottom line. And they're gonna to have to make decisions on that basis. This, the law in my mind, is really going to impact that group. That, that's where this law is going. It's gonna impact their bottom line. Middle, the, the middle market employers are not the ones that we hear about on Wall Street with their stock value fluctuating you know, on a daily basis. These are the folks that their profits go back into the development of the operation and provides wealth to their employees. That's the group that's gonna be hurt here. And we are gonna see cost increases. And you know, I think there were a lot of different ways we saw going dating back to the health reform and back to HIPAA, which would have been means to address the concerns without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Greta, by the way, just so you know, I, I'm, I'm taking notes. I'm not doing email. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Dr. Greta Kostak, and I'm the department chair for graduate nursing <coughs> studies at Marion. And I have a little different approach that I'm going to talk about, and that is the role that nurses are going to play in our future of health care. Uh, specifically, 
Initially, I was asked to address the role of nurse practitioners. However, I want to put forth the idea that nurses in general, be, that, uh, be a professional registered nurse, a nurse educator, a nurse practitioner, nurse midwife, clinical nurse specialist, nurse anesthetist, all will play key roles as we go through healthcare reform. All, um, already two years ago, there was a projection of about 127,000 uh, physician to, uh, shortage estimated by 2025. And 37% of that shortage is going to occur in primary care. And so we are looking at dire straits as primary care is delivered. I feel that nurse practitioners can play a key role in that, and as healthcare for reform moves forward, there are some issues in healthcare reform that were not addressed um, as far as the nurse practitioners. And so I think we need to look more fully at what the role of nursing and nurse practitioners play in the healthcare reform. I am a proponent of primary care. I think nurse practitioners can deliver wonderful primary care, and uh, there are excellent, excellent programs. Uh, Marion University has one. We have several throughout the state. I want to see in healthcare reform primary care emphasized and prevention. I don't think that uh, we need to move away that we need to take a pill to fix things. We need to fix things before the pill is needed. And therefore, I think that what we need to be looking at is a strong emphasis on prevention. And I think you would. Um, you addressed last night that we can get a smoker into the clinic, but we don't get paid to help them quit smoking. That's not seen as something that is uh, important uh, in some aspects. So we need to emphasize that we should be allowed to sit down with patients for 30, 45 minutes, an hour, see them back for repeat visits that only involve either prevention or health uh, care modification. And that is, you know, I really think that's where we need to really, really focus on. We need to move away from fixing things after, trying to fix things after they have happened and really move forward and be looking at prevention. Steve. Yes, good morning. Uh, I'm Steve Brenton, president of the Wisconsin Hospital Association. Uh, I represent 140 <coughs> Wisconsin hospitals Many of them, much like um, Agnesian here, are community-based organizations that are not only acute care hospitals, buildings with beds, but uh, also employ physicians that are extremely active in providing uh, a large array of community-based services uh, for the communities which those organizations serve. Uh, last night, uh, Kevin, listening to your uh, presentation, your excellent presentation, one of your early points, uh, I think, related to how the public looks at health care. Um, I think how the public looks at the health care reform bill um, is, is um, following months and months and months to come of divisive debate and rhetoric uh, probably isn't, uh, um, isn't all that favorable, uh, not, not their favorite subject, but as the public looks at health care for themselves, I, I do think, I totally agree that they look at three specific issues. Uh, the first one being health care costs. Bottom line is, I don't want to pay more than I'm paying right now. In fact, I want to pay less. Okay. The second issue is quality. Uh, I want the very best. I know it's out there, and you know, when I'm sick, uh, that's what I want. When my family's sick, that's what they're going to get. And the third issue is, uh, is the issue of service or access. <laughs> And in this era of instant gratification, I don't want to wait to see Dr. Smith for 20 minutes. I don't want to be treated like I'm going to the Department of Transportation to get my license renewed, which actually is a better experience today than I recall it 20 or 30 years ago in, in Madison. My concern is that if you look at this legislation, those issues largely are unaddressed. Okay? That bill largely about coverage, adding 16 million, 32 million lives, and it was also about insurance reform, okay? Those three key issues that relate to how I look at healthcare, and I suspect most of you look at healthcare, are not addressed. So the bill is either flawed, okay, or 
positive and say that it's incomplete, which means that there's a heck of a lot more work to do. And I think that there will be a lot of tweaks to this legislation uh, in the next several years, you know, once we get beyond the, uh, the, the debates in Washington and beyond. I think there is one area that almost all of us can agree on, and, and Greta just talked about it. The whole issue of prevention and wellness and primary care and focusing on and paying for that, uh, I think will, uh, frankly, help address the cost issue as well as the quality issue uh, and the, uh, the service issue. And I totally agree that, um, that nursing professionals you know, will be the primary caregivers of the future. But perhaps we'll get into that issue later. And so Stephanie, what, what is your perspective? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Harrison. I'm the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Primary Healthcare Association. And we are the member association that works with Wisconsin's 17 federally qualified health centers. Um, we also refer to them kind of in shorthand as community health centers. I don't, I don't know if that's much shorter. Um, community health centers were actually founded back in the 1960s as a kind of a model that uh, one of the founders actually discovered in, in Africa about tying uh, primary care and prevention wellness activities directly to the communities that are being served. So some of the features about a community health center that are kind of unique um, are that they are locally owned and operated, generally nonprofits. All of the uh, health centers in Wisconsin are nonprofit 501c3s. Um, they can also be public entities. Um, but they all have a mission to serve the uninsured and the underserved. So our target market is people below 200% of federal poverty. Um, I think one of the things that we noticed, um, you know, in, in the, the speakers this morning even mentioned that the, the insurance, uh, the healthcare delivery system can be very nimble when there's money somewhere. So if you put money over here, they will figure out a way to reorganize to get over here. I think the biggest challenge is, as a country, how do we figure out how to work with people who are low income, uninsured, or otherwise underserved? You look at some of our community health centers, um, and they are serving as the one of the only uh, primary care providers, uh, dentists, mental health practitioners, or, or uh, physicians, in an entire geographic area. So some of our, our northernmost, most rural health centers are serving a very hard population to reach, where I don't think a traditional model is necessarily going to go there because there aren't the financial rewards. There's not the volume of patients. And there's not the, um, uh, the financial reward to going into Florence County, for instance. Um, you also look at the um, urban inner city areas, like inner city Milwaukee. And I know uh, Steve and I have been working for years and years on um, trying to really get a more coordinated and sophisticated approach to the delivery system in Milwaukee. Because we have plenty of, of providers in the city of Milwaukee. And yet, it's not organized in a way that's effectively meeting people's needs. So we like to say insurance doesn't equal access. And to Steve's point, I think we do need to kind of look at that whole triangle of co quality, cost, and access. And I think the particular niche that I would bring to the conversation is how do we, as a society, really want to look at our most vulnerable neighbors and, and make sure that those folks are taken care of as well. They are being taken care of, oftentimes in the most costly and ineffective places. Um, because you're only getting episodic care at an emergency room when things have gone terribly wrong. Um, so how can we start to really put the value on the primary care and the prevention side as, as a good idea? Very good. So um, I was just uh, taking notes here, and I, I got this email from President Obama. Uh, he said, not really, um, uh, but he tweeted me. Uh, and and uh, he said that uh, he's been very disappointed uh, in the leadership that's been provided by Congress, and so he's appointed this panel to design the future healthcare system, because uh, he heard that we were meeting this morning. And um, so we are now the czars of healthcare. Uh, and I think as, as czars, <clears throat> what I heard is that we all agree that the passage of the legislation called healthcare reform was really an insurance reform package. I mean, I think we all agree with that, right? Uh, and that it didn't deal with the care delivery model. So we now have been empowered to create the care delivery model. So my question for us is, now that we're the czars, uh, what should we do? So why don't I start with Steve, you know, jump in. I'd be happy to jump in. I'd be 
I, I, I tend to be extremely um, optimistic about the assets that Wisconsin has. Mm -hmm. I, I think we can be, we are a state, uh, and I guarantee we have our faults, no question about it, but we have, from a health delivery perspective, um, things in place that others, and I, I would put Minnesota in this category to maybe Iowa, that others dream about. In fact, when the president was in Green Bay, um, back uh, two years ago, <clears throat> his budget director at that time, a guy by the name of Orzag, said, said if the rest of the nation was organized to deliver health care like Green Bay is, we'd have two-thirds of our problem already solved. He could have said the same thing about La Crosse, could have said the same thing about Madison, could have said the same thing about the, uh, about the nation, and what he was talking about is the fact that, um, that we've moved beyond health care being organized around silos of care, you know, the hospital, the physician's office, the pharmacy, um, to having integrated delivery organizations that are organized to provide care, really, um, from the primary care level to, to the hospice level. And if you, look at, if you look at Medicare spending per beneficiary, and, and there's a, a website called the Dartmouth Atlas. Google the Dartmouth Atlas. There's a, a map of the country. Okay? And you can drill down and look at Medicare spending per beneficiary per geographic area. Wisconsin is among the lowest in the nation. And when the annual report card comes out from the Agency of Healthcare Quality and Research, <coughs> Wisconsin and Minnesota every year buy for number one as it relates to highest quality as measured not just from a hospital perspective but from a physician office, home health care, etc. Uh, you add relatively low spending, because I realize health care isn't cheap no matter where you go, relatively low spending to high quality and that equals value. Uh, and I think that there, you know, my sense is we ought to focus more on value and rewarding value in our payment systems as a way of achieving, you know, reductions in, 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 in the escalation of costs, quality. I think you're still going to have an access problem. And I, I, I'm very concerned that his legislation, or the congressional legislation, they kind of ran on the money before they could deal with the uh, access issues, especially as, as it relates to um, pushing um, the uh, uh, pushing out the notion that we need to uh, to quickly uh, produce more primary caregivers, both family medicine physicians as well as nurse practitioners, as a way of addressing the demographic issues that we face, as well as 32 million people that in 2014 are going to expect healthcare outside of the emergency room. And where are they going to get that? When we already have a system that is fairly, you know, that So where are we going to get that? So how is, what would be the design features that you put in place? I mean, you know, I mean, I'm going to push on them. Yeah, because uh, I, I agree with you. I, I think we really need to push scope of practice changes to the care payment. Okay. Um, as it relates to primary care, um, especially through nursing. So would you do that for pharmacists as well? Yeah, I don't know enough about pharmacy, but I, I think, you know, pharmacists can be caregivers to a certain extent. Um, I also think that we need to uh, to invest in uh, medical schools, growing class size, and residency programs, which are essential. We lose all kinds of medical students in Wisconsin, but if they go and do their residencies outside the state, they are not coming back. So, so uh, medical school class size focused at primary care, not at more specialists, uh, as well as residency programs. But as you know, Kevin, um, producing physicians is quite the long pipeline. So we had to start two years ago. Yeah. Uh, the nursing uh, issue perhaps has a shorter time. Okay. So, uh, so embedded in what uh, Steve mentioned, uh, Bob and Brent, is the notion of value-based insurance plans. And as you know, that the whole concept of value-based insurance is really sort of getting some legs, if you will, nationally. <clears throat> you, maybe you should speak to that, because it seems to me that one of the core issues that we're talking about here is that the, the current reimbursement model 
you know, do a procedure, get a payment, uh, do something to somebody, get a payment, isn't going to work in this new era. And, and value-based insurance is, is a concept, at least, that uh, sort of addresses that. So maybe, do you want to speak to that issue? Is that is that part of what we need to do? I think it is. Yeah, but I think <laughs> what we get to the idea of value-based insurance is that we need to take a, a fresh look at how do we how do we address care and prevention issues right now? Uh -huh. The primary issues. I'm going to address this a little bit. Right now, under uh, I'm a, a huge advocate of wellness programs, mm -hmm. and I think that they can be, if they're done properly, they can be a huge plus in minimizing cost and really utilization issues down the road. But right now, from a governmental perspective, we are so hamstrung in putting into place an effective program under the wellness initiatives that they're really, they're, it's just, you know, cotton candy. It's just, it's fodder. There's no value to them. For example, we all know that uh, having uh, four meals a day at, at the McDonald's and smoking uh, five packs of cigarettes a day and three and a half quarts of Jack Daniels probably is not a healthy lifestyle. Probably. I'm not sure about that. I'll, I'll let you know. Um, but when we're looking at that perspective, when I say, when I know from every medical uh, item that's out there that smoking is a very bad thing, there's nothing I can do about it. I can't rate individuals differently to motivate their behavior from a financial perspective. I can only say, will you please not do this? And there are no teeth. Because if I go that route and say, I'm going to set up a diff premium differential here, what well, the Department of Labor's come out and said, well, geez, you know, smoking may very well be a disability. It's an addiction. And therefore, you're really targeting smoking addicts. And that's what this is all about. We missed the perspective and trying to create an effective uh, system where we can, you know, have wellness initiatives. Right now, wellness plans are, are mouths. I mean, there really is no teeth to it. And until we as a society say, we understand that obesity is an issue, we understand that smoking is an issue, and we need to take steps to curtail that, until we can make that, that call, we're really, you know, we're dumping it back on these people's laps saying, figure it out. So you're saying we have to create a reimbursement model that creates accountability on all of us who are the consumers of healthcare. Not, it's not just taking care of people after the fact, which we, we clearly, I think, would agree we've got some issues there, but we've got to proactively get people engaged in their own health. Right, because you're really dealing with three groups. You're dealing with the uninsured, mm -hmm. the underinsured, and then the, the, the employee, that's sort of that middle group aspect. The one thing, from the employer perspective, we can control that, that side of the equation through plan designs and things like that, but we don't address your concern. We don't address, we, and in fact, in recent years, when we went to family care, we kind of gutted the whole idea of county ownership of their health delivery systems for the underserved. So, so Bob, let's, let's take this one step further. I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's my job. So, uh, okay, so let's take this and let's do a metaphor. I believe in Wisconsin, I don't know what the penalty is, but if, if you drive a motorcycle in Wisconsin and you don't wear a helmet, there's a fine. No? <laughs> what kind of retro state is this? <laughs> and until recently, it was fine to drive your snowmobile drunk, too. So. Okay, so, okay, so bad example. Uh, I think I just figured out a piece of legislation that should be introduced. Uh, um, but if you don't wear your seatbelt, is there a fine for that? There is. So what kind of fine is it? hundred bucks? I'm not exactly sure. Anybody? Plus $10. Got it. It's a secondary. Ten dollars. It's a secondary fine. You don't want to get fined. Okay, so, okay, so I'll agree with Steve that we have the foundation for a good healthcare system, but we've got some rules that the legislature probably needs to deal with if we're going to get people incentivized. Ten bucks doesn't incentivize anybody to do much of anything. So my question for you, the reason I'm raising the issue, is do we want to go down the road? If you're saying we need to engage people, so how to engage them? Okay, I can tell you that in North Dakota, where I come from, the, there's a $100 fine if you don't wear your helmet. Okay, So in North Dakota, most people wear their helmets when they drive their motorcycle, because they don't want to be fined. So if you go down that road, are we going to find people who smoke? I mean, we put people in jail who smoke marijuana, 
or use OxyContin that they buy on the street. So where do we draw the line? Are we gonna do that? Are we gonna say if you're over a certain body mass that, you know, there's a fine, you gotta pay a fine? Where, where, where do we go? And I think what you're suggesting right now is what I believe would be an effective wellness plan as a disincentive. I mean, okay. we, people do things for the most part not in an altruistic manner. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I'm not gonna stop going down today because I feel it's a healthy thing. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be, because I got my, my cholesterol results and they're 8,000 points. Right. Uh, what's my disincentive? And until we can get to that point where we put a cost along with the undesired behavior or a consequence, we're not gonna get there. So you think we do need to do something? We absolutely need to do something. Okay. So the debate becomes how to do that, probably. Correct. That would be your argument. So, uh, so let me turn to the providers here, to Stephanie and to Greta. What, what, are, your, what are your perspectives on that issue? And you, you actually see people in the clinics. And, you know, what do you think? Um, I agree that there has to be a lot of teeth into to changing and promoting positive health behaviors. And I can tell somebody that comes in and smokes, I can tell them at every visit, every time I see them multiple times, you need to smoke and stop smoking and this is why. I'll bring out the chart that shows within one hour this is what happens, in eight hours this happens, 24 hours, six months, one year. I can tell them that my father died from lung cancer because he was a heavy smoker and it doesn't matter. We need, you know, there, we, we need to go about it in a very different way. We need to look at promoting positive behaviors. I mean, my husband, I'm under my husband's health plan and you know, there's some positive because my blood pressure is low, my cholesterol level is low, and some other things. We get gift cards, um, which is great, but um, would I want, you know, would I plan to lose 40 pounds because I got a $75 gift card to Kohl's? Probably not. Um, so I think we need to look at. Would you do it for frequent flyer points? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and cruises. Cruises. <laughs> change your lifestyle, I don't think that that works. So I think we really need to look at um, how it is and what we're doing, how we're helping patients uh, to see in the long term what it what it's like. And you know, I've been a nurse practitioner for a long time and I've got I've had patients come in and they had extremely high cholesterol levels, but what they say to me when I start talking diet and exercise is give me the pill, I don't have time. Okay. Give me the pill. Stephanie, what are your thoughts? Well, it's just a caveat. I am not a, a provider. Um, I work with providers, but I'm not a provider. Um, I think that, you know, I think it's a classic struggle to figure out how we engage in our own health care. And I mean, I think any one of us would probably say we engage it more or less successfully, depending on how much time we have. Um, I think when we're working, you know, specifically our health centers are working with people in poverty um, at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, a lot of times, you know, the, the incentives and disincentives are a little bit on a different scale. Um, so if you actually look at poverty as, a, as an issue, um, and there are books written about this, you can read up on them, um, people who have a chronic problems with poverty, especially intergenerational poverty, are going to have a different notion of time. So um, you're not going to see them saving for college or retirement or things like that because your, your whole notion of time and so when you're talking about quitting smoking, that's a time-oriented problem. And today, I have three or four dollars in my pocket and I can buy some cigarettes, you know? It's a different notion of time. <clears throat> Our health centers typically are working with, health, uh, with people, trying to really meet them where they're at. And we use a, a, a lot of health centers, um, practitioners, both uh, nurse practitioners, physicians, uh, mental health providers, uh, really work on something called um, behavioral interviewing and, and motivational interviewing. So motivational interviewing is where you really try to meet people exactly where they're at. And you say, I see there's a discrepancy between what you value and what you do. We want to help you close that gap. But today, smoking is not my issue. Today, I want to make sure that my two-year-old has food. So help them address that problem and they start to feel a little more confident in their abilities to sort of meet today's needs and tomorrow's needs, and then you can start taking ownership of those longer term priorities. It's not a quick fix, it's not a pill. Um, but I, I don't know that incentives and disincentives are gonna work for population in poverty, as well as they might for someone who has um, a 
little different notion of time. Okay. But let's turn to the, the question that um, all of you sort of alluded to. Uh, I think, Steve, you jumped into it on, uh, directly in terms of medical education. I, I want to talk about the workforce issue. Um, and I'm sure we all have perspectives on that. Uh, so, Steve, you were suggesting that you know we should see additional expansion of medical school classes, etc. Um, let, let, let me challenge that for a moment, uh, and it's based on the notion that it does take a long time to train uh, folks in, in primary care, especially. So, um, is a workforce model that's based on the physician providing care is that the model of the future? Because you were also talking about integrated care. And if you have integrated care, it seems to me that the approach that should be taken would be a team approach. Most physicians, from my vantage point, aren't <laughs> trained to work as team leaders. So how, how do, what, what things do we need to incorporate, if we're going to expand the classes, what things do we need to incorporate into the curriculum so that we get a different product? Yeah, well, you know, that's, that, is the, uh, that is a big, complicated question with a not-so-simple sum by solution to it. Um, We've got an hour. Let me, let, me, <laughs> let, me first, let me first say that we, I, I think it's unequivocal, we will have a physician shortage in the not too distant future. Okay? Largely primary care, but perhaps not only primary care, and part of it is a distribution issue. You go to, uh, you know, Waukesha County or Ozaki County, and it's different than if you go up to Oneida County or to Iron County. Um, so I think my sense is, though, we need, we need to really have an emphasis on family medicine, what used to be called internal medicine, geriatric medicine, you know, folks who actually work with people and with teams of other caregivers, which I view will primarily be, you know, very trained nursing staff that in many cases will be doing basic physicals, etc., cetera, um, and being paid accordingly. Um, without question, though, also, medical schools produce a lot of terrific scientists um, who see things, in some cases, as being black or white, and the more specialized they are, the more black or white they see it. And uh, that has to be also part of the curriculum. I don't think you legislate it, however. Um, I'm, I'm rather gun-shy about the notion that government is going to solve a lot of these problems. The government can give basic direction and create, create incentives, and then the private sector needs to get it done. But um, I, I, I am a big proponent of a team approach, a wellness, a, a medical home type model, okay, um, as being the way to address these complicated issues you know, going forward. Um, and I do think that additional physicians is part of that, but certainly not the only. So, okay, so let's extend that discussion because uh, I think this is an interesting issue. Um, so if we take family physicians, general internists, pediatricians, and I think about the model that we've developed for giving them the skills that they have, basically what we've asked family physicians to do is to learn as much as they can about a lot of different things and then provide direct care put their hands on people, right? We're, and, and we've done that for pediatricians and general interests as well. Is that the model or should we on the alternative? Because one of the things I learned when I moved out of the direct practice of providing care and I moved into the management is that I was incompetent as a physician. I, I didn't know how to manage people. I didn't know how to lead teams. And I had to learn a whole new set of skills. As a matter of fact, if I had to work with me 25 years ago, 20 years ago, in management, I would have quit in absolute disgust. I was so bad. Now, over 20 years, I've learned a little bit. I'm a lot better. I wouldn't necessarily quit in disgust. I wouldn't like quit. But uh, that being said, part of the issue that we're dealing with here is the way we train people. So are we training family physicians, general internists, and pediatricians correctly? Do we need to alter the model for how we educate them? Do we need to teach them how to be team leaders? So, uh, maybe yeah, Stephanie and then Greta. So I'm, I'm hoping for provocation here. I've been telling them that we're gonna have a Jerry Springer moment up here. <laughs> so, um, 
I think I think everybody is going to need to be practicing at the very top of their license and their capabilities. I don't know that it's necessarily the physician's job to be the team leader. Um, I think that we often ascribe that person that role because of their training and their education, but that might not be what they do best. Um, I think that um, one of the best models I've ever seen, and, and community health centers have been doing team-based care for years and years, um, I, one of the best models I have seen was when a team, physician, nurse practitioner, nurse, medical assistant, was working on the care of their patients, and they gave the authority and responsibility to the medical assistant to be the ringleader. <laughs> it's your job to find those numbers. It's your job to find those patients. This, this woman, Isabel, from Bridge Clinic in Wausau, was like a pit bull. <laughs> the friendliest pit bull you've ever met in your entire life. But she was like, Dr. So-and-so, you need to be right here right now. You need to be doing this, this, and this. Oh, I just saw that patient so-and-so showed up. I'm gonna give them a flu shot while they're here for their well child check. I'm gonna do, you know, and so she was the one connecting all the dots. And because they empowered her to do that, she could take on that role. And that freed up the physician and the nurse and the nurse practitioner to do what they really did best, which was give patients the, the very detailed advice or coaching or prescription or whatever it was that they needed that they were trained to do. So I think we really need to be thinking far more broadly about the care delivery system. Okay, interesting. Uh, Greta, what's your thoughts? And then Bob and Beth, maybe? We'll well, I'm going to totally, totally agree with you. And you, you hit upon um, medical <laughs> homes and we, and also silo, siloing of care has got to stop. We need to work collaboratively. We need to work as a team. I know up in the Appleton Fox Valley area right now, they are doing that exact um, type of a practice where uh, even the receptionist has some authority to do things that they haven't been able to do in the past. And when there is buy-in by a team, care will be better, care will be more efficient. And I think we really need to look at that I've been reading several articles lately on the implementation of medical homes. Medical homes where people, uh, there are several different models, but there's been some very effective medical homes where a physician and a nurse practitioner work collaboratively, seeing the sickest of the sick patients. So where many of us are expected to work on productivity and see 20 patients a day, uh, in medical homes, some of these models allow for seeing far fewer patients but delivering intense care, intense education. And what this does then, in turn, it is keeping these patients out of the high cost emergency room. So in the long run, when you see, when you're used to that model of seeing 20 patients a day, being on high productivity, limiting your time frame that you have with the patient, and looking at seeing only four to five patients a day, thinking how can that be cost effective? Well, guess what, the research is coming out that indeed it is a cost effective. So what you're suggesting is that uh, two things there. One, the Pareto principle applies, the 80-20 rule, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we should be focused on the 20% of the problems because that's going to give us 80% of the value. That is what I am thinking is going to probably you know, be where we're going to need to be spending uh, some of our time and getting, like I said, away from that. Right. I have to see 20 patients right. a day. Maybe I can and be six and impact them. The other thing that, you're, that you were pretty clear about then is embedded in that is that the, the reimbursement model has to change. That if, well, you know, if we pay for 20 <laughs> things a day, people will do 20 things a day. Yeah, versus absolutely. Versus if we pay for a medical home, you know, people will provide medical home services. Mm -hmm. right? uh, precisely, and I think we'll need the data yep. to support that medical homes do work. So, uh, Bob, what's, what's your perspective in breath? Yeah, I, I guess. Uh, Mine's a bit different. I mean, I'm listening to the, the maybe approaching Jerry Springer moment here. Um, and I look so at- Do we have some chairs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll, I'll leave that one. Um, <laughs> when we're looking at the delivery system, there's, there's two different things here. Uh, a great delivery system does not equal a cost-effective delivery system. And the thing that we need to measure here, balance here, is if we're talking about team, where the sum of the parts do not exceed the whole, I'm with you. But if we're talking about having other types of approaches here where we're gonna be paying a doctor and a nurse and a CNA and all these other folks where what used to cost 100 is now 200, 
that is a, that's a failure of a model that's coming down the road here. And so from my perspective, from an employer perspective, from a cost perspective, at the bottom line is she, we need to develop a program and a system where I agree with you, we're, go, we're going after symptoms. We're identifying you know, the smoking and the drinking and the McDonald's and all that stuff and curtailing those behaviors, which would then result in an overall impact. My big question, my big problem here is, how are we gonna cost that into a model? While well, we're changing these reimbursement models up front here, I can see that the insurance company saying, that's great, but my actuaries right now have no data to base this on, so while you've changed these models and you've changed this reimbursement formula, I still have this presumption of this, that this is what's gonna occur down the road here. I'm gonna price this model plus 10% or 50% because of these changes here, so now I'm starting to see the spike. If we can get some way in the, you know, in the actuarial evaluation of these products and design issues, I see it successful. But until we can control the, the costing and the methodologies associated with it, I don't see this successful, right? So b b before we go to Brett, I just want to follow up on one point here, uh, which is the question of um, <coughs> value, okay? So you, you said that if it costs uh, $200 and it used to cost 100 you know, there's some question about that. My question for you is, so what if we invest the $200 and we get the return, but it, it comes over the next five years? So what do we need to put in place to, I mean, because one of the things I think insurance companies get beat up on is they make these short-term decisions. So they're making decisions that apply for the next six to 12 months because in 12 months, you know, I could be gone into another insurance company so they don't get the return on investment. So the question becomes, what do we need to put in place from a policy standpoint to allow insurance companies to have a more longitudinal perspective along with the pr uh, providers? Because I can tell you that as a family physician, that I really thought about my patients from a long-term perspective because I was hoping that they were gonna stick with me. And in fact, they did over you know, a period of years versus you know, insurance companies. I've had three different insurance companies in the last five years, not because of my choice, but because of my company's choice. Right, and your company's choice is probably motivated because Money. of dollars. Money. And so how do I, from a policy standpoint, what do we need to put in place to change that so that, you know? Well, first thing we need to do is to stop pretending that health insurance or medical care for individuals is a one-size-fits-all. Stephanie's issues that she's addressing here today are very different than my employers in offering group insurance health. Yours is a completely different demographic, completely different social economic concern, and we need to pretend, stop pretending that doesn't exist. Okay. We need to address that. From the employer's perspective, I think what we need to do is to, to create some disincentives, the wellness programs again. Mm -hmm. Because the, ins the insurance companies, while we talk about it's a six, 12 month perspective as far as valuation, I don't believe that. I mean, okay. We as employers look at it from a six to 12 month perspective. The insurance industry looks at it as a longer term <coughs> issue and they build in those long term growth costs which result in higher costs for the employers because they are anticipating that you're gonna switch to somebody else. I'm gonna end up with an adverse selection group here, mm -hmm. so I need to make sure I got that, that buffer here mm -hmm. to cover that. We need to create some consistency through coverage mandates where we do provide you know, uh, basic cares for uh, well-being issues or health issues, things along those lines, where we create that minimal <coughs> criteria that's gonna cut across all industry to create stabilization and cost. That's right. The second prong of it uh, comes down to uh, taking a look at, again, the wellness aspect and imposing those on top of that. I think by those two mandates, we're gonna create stability in the insurance industry that we don't currently have. Is that something you wanna add to that? Yeah, I should add a couple points. Um, number one, and, and I'm not here to bash insurance companies anymore than I'm here to defend them, but when an insurance company raises its premium rates, for instance, and we're talking fully insured here, but in a group health plan setting, um, that's not directly tied toward or correlated to claims history. All right, insurance companies are business models, and this goes this pervasive through all lines of insurance. They use money to make investments. And you look at dips in our economy over the last 20 to 30 years, that's when you see spikes in insurance coverage, premium rates. Same with malpractice insurance, same with other lines of, uh, even the property and casualty insurance. Now, 
I'm not entirely sure what to do about that, but states have the authority to regulate fully insured health plans. And right now, the state of Wisconsin, I don't know the exact number, but the state of Wisconsin allows insurance companies to raise premium rates by a specific amount. Now, they require that to be loosely tied to some kind of claims data. And that's what we, you know, that's what employers pay their insurance brokers to do, to use that claims data to shop for the best insurance plan. So perhaps, even though I'm generally against more regulation on the government side, perhaps to help the cost standpoint and to help maybe change the reimbursement model, because that reimbursement model change that we're talking about is going to have to come from the insurance side and from the provider side, okay, being, being in agreement on that. But to help change that model, wait, maybe we need a little more regulation in terms of how insurance companies come to their rates as far as increases go. Okay. So, so Steve, let me turn to you because uh, of your comments earlier about the, the use of integrated care. Um, you know, there's lots of discussion going on about new models, etc. It seems to me that this whole discussion about the relationship of the insurance companies cannot be divorced from the delivery side. So what, what do we do from a policy standpoint to bring those two divides, if you will, back together? Yeah, and actually in Wisconsin, we have 11 provider-owned insurance companies. Mm -hmm. Whereas in most states, you've got this big Blue Cross you know, health insurer and United Healthcare and a couple other commercials. Um, in this state, you know, for example, in the Madison area, there, there really is no commercial insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, the provider systems have their own health plans, which you know have the potential then of aligning the kind of incentive, I think, aligning better the kinds of incentives we're talking about here. But um, it is a big deal to move from something that is working, at least as it relates to paying your bills, which is this procedure-based approach. The more you do, the more you get paid into doing it, frankly, the way we all agree it should be done, and that is managing an episode of care uh, and better rewarding the primary caregivers as well as men. Uh, we have constructed our successful delivery organizations around, you know, do a lot of this stuff, a lot of MRI, a lot of radiological procedures, in, um, outpatient surgical procedures, a lot of testing, because that's the cash cow to pay for everything else. And quite frankly, um, for most of my members, it is the hospital where all that expensive stuff happens. That's the profit center to pay for the community-based things they do and the emergency room, which are their money users. So how do, you how do you transition from that model, which we know we need to transition from, but it works, at least on a day-to-day -day basis, it pays the bills, into the model that we think we you know, need to be in the future. And gosh, I wish I had the uh, magic wand to do that. I can tell you, though, uh, because I think Bob mentioned that we need to have data uh, that allow us to know what an episode of care costs and then try to, to develop innovative um, pilot projects to try to make that happen. Um, we, we now in Wisconsin actually have that data over the last couple of years all of the payers have come together and shared their data. So we actually have episodes of care data. We know what the price should be, the cost should be, for example, of an average knee replacement, not just a surgical procedure, but everything that goes into before having that procedure and then the rehabilitation after. And we have provider organizations in the next year or so will come together with payers and begin to experiment with paying for that overall procedure as opposed to the component parts of that procedure, okay? Which, again, theoretically ought to incent people to do it, you know, to do high quality outcomes with less stuff because being paid for that unnecessary stuff, you know, is no longer gonna be incentive. Mm -hmm. We're gonna do it for knee replacements, we're also going to be doing it for uh, diabetes care, which is one of those chronic illnesses <coughs> that are part of that unbelievable expense um, that is not very well paid for by 
by these teams or caregivers that we think ought to be doing the job right. So let's uh, let's shift the discussion. We've been talking a lot about cost and you know reimbursement models and care delivery models, etc. Let's let's shift to the whole question of quality. Um, last night I, I I made a point. Uh, I don't know if you folks agree with it or not. Is that one of the issues is that in healthcare we're not very transparent. Um, so where, where do you come down on transparency? I, you know, I, I'm of the opinion that we should take all the data that we have and just put it out there on the web. Uh, now that's a bit scary. Mm, makes me kind of nervous. But you know what? I think that would probably do a lot towards changing healthcare. If all the data was out there, it's amazing to me what people will do when information is available. They start manipulating it. They come up with, hey, did you notice these patterns, etc. Uh, so wh where do we fall down on the issue of transparency and quality? Uh, because that seems to me to be a core issue if we're going to drive change. Because there's a lot of data that shows very clearly that, you know, for example, there's a really interesting study that was published in one of the journals here a couple of years ago that if you give data to the individual physician, you know, and you give them their report card, and you give it to them, you'll see an incremental change in behavior. If you then take that data and say, well, we're going to give it to the department, and all the department people, so all of my colleagues have that data, you see a much bigger change. And then if you take the data and publish it, you get a massive change. <laughs> so my question is, you know, if we give it to Dr. Fickenshire, uh, I guess I can make a few changes. If we give it to the department and they say, Dr. Fickenshire, you know, <laughs> get with it, buddy. You're not doing a very good job. Versus we publish it and all of a sudden everybody in the world knows that Dr. Fickenshire is a schmuck and he's not doing a very good job. I'm going to change my behavior. So my question then becomes, so where do we fall down? Where, where do you folks believe the employers are? Where's the care delivery system? Where are the individual providers? Where are we at on trend? Yeah, go ahead, Stephanie. I'm, my hunch is that everybody at this table will agree that transparency is really critical. Wisconsin is actually a leader in doing that, and so we see the Wisconsin Collaborative for Healthcare Quality, a lot of the work that WHA has done, or Crisis <coughs> Checkpoint, and things like that on their website. Um, you can get a lot of good quality data um, already available, very publicly available on websites. Um, I do think it's really going to be important, though, to recognize that there are probably two aspects of the quality that we have to pay attention to, and I'm not sure that we always pay attention to both equally. I do think that quality published is going to be very helpful in driving insurance company behavior, practice behavior, provider behavior. Um, but the reality is that a lot of patients aren't going to necessarily care if you, um, you know, you as a provider um, have an average diabetic A1C score of 7.9. Mm -hmm. um, they are going to care if your team makes you makes it very accessible for them, if they feel cared about, if they have a good guide in navigating the healthcare delivery system. And I suspect that if we actually started paying more attention to that side of the equation on the quality part of it, we would actually start to see better outcomes as well. So I think the shame works on the institutional side. I think the, um, the, the quality as perceived by the patient experience is going to be a big driver in, in getting that patient engagement and in driving um, the real outcome delivery. So what you're suggesting is that uh, all of us are more driven by the experience than we are about uh, the data. Yeah, and I'd like to follow up with that because uh, I, I totally agree with Stephanie that historically what we have reported to you have been clinical process measures that create a lot of yawns. Um, you know, aspirin delivered within 24 hours of arrival for a heart condition. Um, I think all of you expect that if that's clinically appropriate, it ought to darn well happen, and quite frankly, it happens at 95 plus percent level in almost all of our hospitals. What we're beginning to report, and Stephanie meant, mentioned things that are going on in Wisconsin right now, those of you that are interested, uh, two websites, one is Checkpoint, uh, C-H-E-C-K, capital P-O-I-N-T, you, you might find it by Googling Checkpoint or Checkpoint Wisconsin, or going on the Wisconsin Hospital Association website. The other is a website done by the Wisconsin Collaborative for Healthcare Quality. It's Wisconsin WCHQ. It has performance measures that are largely clinic-based, whereas Checkpoint is hospital-based. Go on Checkpoint and look up um, uh, Agnesian um, uh, Hospital, and, and you'll see.
see 120 some measures. Some of them, okay, are in fact the very outcome measures we're talking about. <coughs> Patient experience at that hospital, and then you could compare it to other local hospitals. You see what patients say in their surveys about how things went. Frankly, I think that's a lot more interesting um, than whether or not you know these clinical um, measures were followed. We're also now beginning to report mortality, you know, deaths, uh, rates that are acute that are addressed for acuity of care. I, I don't want to get too technical here. We're actually beginning to report things that I think are of interest. What I think patients really want are physician measures, physician-specific scores. I think, quite frankly, we're a ways away from seeing those, especially simple report cards. Um, I can tell you one thing, if you do start reporting hospital-specific and really physician-specific scores, that data better be unimpeachable, okay? Otherwise, otherwise they're gonna be such a negative reaction, you're gonna set that whole movement back by years. Uh, I'm very optimistic, though, that the glide path is for far, far greater transparency. The other positive thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention is that, and because we've been reporting clinical measures, um, we being the Wisconsin Hospital Association, on a hospital-specific basis now for seven years. And absolutely everything that we have reported has shown improvement during that seven years, which I think uh, basically addresses this issue. If you report it, it will improve. Even though, frankly, I don't think we have a lot of consumer engagement, but clinicians are looking at what they're doing, especially in comparison to other hospitals, and that's becoming you know, kind of an incentive to, uh, to do better. Interesting, but uh, so I'm a foodie, so um, I, I like to go to restaurants, and you know, it's one of the things that's interesting about the food industry is that um, they don't really report on you know whether or not you cook the fish for a minute and twenty six seconds or not, and whether or not you made the sauce the day before and then added it at the last minute. That's not the kind of data that gets reported. What gets reported is the ambience of the experience, the quality of the experience, the food and the taste and all that kind of stuff. And what you're sort of suggesting, Steve, is that healthcare has gotten stuck in talking about what are the specifics that we do in the kitchen versus what's the ambience of the experience. And that really we need to shift towards that because as consumers, we expect that the fish will be cooked properly. We don't know exactly how it's done, but we sure know what it should taste like. Right? Yeah. Am, am I on track with where yeah. we need to go in healthcare? And that's not something we've done in healthcare. People want outcomes that yeah. they can understand. Yeah. You know, they want to know that for patients that have recently been at a certain hospital or a clinic, yeah. were they given at discharge instructions that they were be able to talk about and to understand before they left? Mm -hmm. And that's what they did now. So, so bottom of breath, uh, on the insurance side, I mean, so how do we get the insurance companies to sort of create models that provide payments for that kind of an experience? Yeah, actually, if I can be non-responsive for a minute, and sure. uh, more so than usual, um, <laughs> and, and just back up, I think because of geographic constraints and also coverage constraints, patients don't have a lot of choices that, that I think we're, we're talking about. And I think the type of data that is more important to the patient, maybe so a little more important than their provider's grade or a provider score, is data that's pertinent to that patient. For instance, Cleveland Clinic's going through a program right now where they're making transparent medical records and charts. I'm sure a number of other hospital groups are doing a similar thing. Um, but I, I know from reading research papers on the Cleveland Clinic that quality of care has been thought to be improved, and not to mention how quickly physicians will um, make reports on the charts and get those charts finished because you know people are expecting them. They have an online access code. They can go and read those within 24 hours of their appointment. So I think that's something also we should mention here in, in, while we're talking about transparency is getting
getting that information specific to the patient back to the patient. Mm -hmm. okay. Ron, any additional questions? I guess that I just got a, more of a question than anything else, Steve. Um, yeah, when we're looking at you know these these rating systems and things like that, is this is this a time that we should be looking at contraction uh, within the industry as far as hospitals and you know I don't want to say rationing but rationalizing delivery systems in the community. I know that in my community, we, uh, a number of hospitals have gone through a remodeling process, mm -hmm. and we have the exact same uh, machinery to make them cutting edge at six different hospitals, and we've only got maybe 30,000 people in my area. Does that make sense? I mean, what does, do we need to rethink that and go to what Fred was talking about, maybe uh, focusing more of our energies to some of these uh, alternate delivery systems as a means of maximizing care? I, I generally get the, uh, and, and if you would have asked it, I bet Greg Unterheim would have asked it from the, uh, for this hospital edifice complex uh, question, um, which you know can be difficult depending where you are in the state or the, the nation. I think the only thing that would make less sense um, relative to allowing local community governing boards make decisions relative to hospital expansions and remodelings and capacity would be to have government make those decisions, quite frankly. Um, my other comment is that I, I am absolutely firmly convinced that, and I realize that cranes in front of hospitals is a very visible phenomenon as opposed to the tens of millions of dollars being spent on implementation of electronic health records, uh, where Wisconsin is a national leader, um, and not only in the capital involved, but the ongoing operating expense, um, as well as investments, I think, in the very kind of thing that we're all talking about, which is in primary care and community-based services. They don't get near the uh, level of attention that you know another hospital in Waukesha County gets. Um, you know, but I, I realize it is an Achilles heel to a certain extent for the industry, and those organizations you know have their reasons for doing what they've done. But I realize it um, it, it often comes up when it comes to the fact that we've already spent enough, and why we're building you know, additional capacity. I think if you truly are going to have fully integrated delivery organizations, they're going to have to have hospitals as components. Um, and that is exactly what has occurred in much of Wisconsin. Okay, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to shift and, and, and engage all of you folks in, in this panel. We've got this uh, czar that President Obama uh, has empowered, and so we've got some questions. I think there's probably still more questions. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of Phil Donahue. I know he's retired, but uh, he's a good friend. Uh, so I'd like to uh, come up into the audience and uh, get some of your questions. So who wants to go first? Yeah, back over here. Okay, uh, there was a lot of talk early on about worksite wellness, and if you were to create the best worksite wellness program, what would it look like? What are we missing right now? Uh, I'll take that first. Um, from my perspective, first of all, is for the employer to identify what their goals are. Uh, after the goals are identified for the wellness delivery system, uh, what is the uh, outcome, what is the information that's desired out of that, that process? Number three, get a partner. Uh, I've got a, a lot of employers out there that say we're going to a wellness program and they, they do it themselves, they home cook it. And they get information back and they have no idea what they're looking at. Uh, getting a qualified partner to identify, evaluate your information for you, come back with, uh, I, I'm a big advocate of Oct Health nurses on site. I think it's a very valuable tool for employers utilizing that information to get the data that you're really looking for to make an efficient health wellness program. Uh, the sake of getting information for the sake of getting it, I mean, what are we doing? I've got one client that spent hundreds of thousands of dollars putting in a wellness program, and I said, well, how are you doing with the data? She goes, oh, 
with the old box right over there. I said, well, what are you doing with it? Well, nothing. We just want to make sure we get the information asked. And that, now we got it. Well, that's, that's a waste of money. And what all these folks are saying here, what's your effective delivery system? That's my suggestion. And building off the data from your partner to design programs and plans to attack certain wellness issues that your, your employees are facing, and then motivate or incentivize those individuals through economic rewards to attain your desired goals. Okay. Okay. Any other perspectives on the panel on this issue? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, from a bigger picture side of things, you know, the federal government says, and, and they have said it, you know, without quite saying that during all this health reform debate, wellness programs are going to be the way of the future. They're the way to go. Yet they're talking out both sides of their mouth because on the other side, they have really made it hard for these wellness programs to gain traction from a compliance standpoint. HIPAA's portability rules and non-discrimination non rules under HIPAA really handcuff what employers and insurance programs can do with regard to wellness plans. And the data has to be contained and, 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 and only used in certain areas and only certain types of incentives can be provided. And if you provide these incentives, you must jump through these hoops over here. Now, some of that regulation is obviously necessary to avoid abuse or to avoid list billing, things of that nature. But I think um, some loosening of those reins will achieve what the government is trying to do in, in terms of encouraging employers and insurance programs to develop more creative wellness plans like we're talking about here. Okay, Greta, did you want to add something? Yes, and just, I agree totally with Bob. I think it starts with doing a needs ass assessment, and it isn't just what the employer wants. You need to have buy-in from employees, because if the employees are not invested in what the changes, they are not going to participate in that. And you know there can be quite a, a, a you know a big difference between what the employer thinks he wants and what the employees think they want. So I think a needs assessment with employee uh, input is imperative. And I also think that a lot of things, when we talk about costs, can be done very economically. At Marion, we have a health and wellness committee, and they arrange different things that can be extremely low cost to do. Um, so I think you need to look at the whole gamut. Are, are you going to buy expensive exercise equipment and build a gym? Um, look at that employee buy-in and what those employees want to do and put some of the onus on them. Okay, well, good. Uh, other thought, other questions? Yeah. Let me get there. Just a second. This is a good exercise. <laughs> Due to the shortage of physicians and what we are going to see, why in 2018 master's nurse practitioner programs need to be doctorate programs, which I believe will decrease nurse practitioners in the future? Is there a problem with the master's NPs today and why is, there, why is this occurring and how will this affect the healthcare delivery in the future? Yeah, uh, Greta's gonna answer because she actually does this. But I have to say that I am very concerned about the decrease the, the degree creep that we're seeing in some of the healthcare professions, pharmacy, physical therapy, you know, some of the nursing degrees. I absolutely don't believe that you need to be a PhD to do a lot of the primary care. In fact, I think the PhD um, candidates are likely to be the faculty, et cetera. Um, I don't know the, the details relative to this requirement, but I, I tell you, we've seen it across the board in the medical professions, and I think it could be an impediment uh, to uh, doing the necessary workforce changes that we're going to need very, very soon. Yeah, what are your thoughts? <laughs> you have come to the profession. <laughs> uh, you have some very, very good points that you have made. When the edict came out that all advanced practice nurses should be prepared at the doctoral level, many, many programs, including the vast majority of those programs in the state of Wisconsin that offer advanced practice nursing degrees, went ahead and developed the DNP. At Marion, we decided to wait. We decided to wait for a number of reasons. First of all, nursing historically has um, said they wanted to do several things and they don't always move as quickly as they were said. You know, said. Um, so we waited. And I was out at a conference, I went to conferences um, in January and February in San Diego and in Scottsdale uh, with looking um, with our accreditors and they have put the 2015 deadline on that. It is not standing. Our accreditors cannot 
They can encourage, but they cannot mandate that we do the DMP. As a result, at Marion, we have seen just a great influx in students, those master's students who do not feel that they want to proceed with the DMP. Uh, what are the pros and the cons? And when you look at the DMP, there's several different, um, and a PhD, several different specialties. And some DMPs focus on program planning and evaluation. <coughs> if that's not something you want to do in the future with your master's degree and you want hands-on primary care, I believe that then the MSM is appropriate for you. So right now, as, as we sit at Marion, we are not going with the DMP, we are staying with the MSM. That is not to say we aren't making curricular changes. Uh, in, this, in the next few years, there is not a drop dead date, but the adult nurse practitioner and the gerontological nurse practitioners are gonna to meld together. They're gonna to do away with both of those specialties and it's gonna become the adult gerontological nurse practitioner. Therefore, we'll be better able to deal with our aging population. Uh, at Marion, we've already integrated that into our curriculum a great deal, so we will be making some changes. But at this point, we are having an MSN um, level entry. And will we move to the DMP? Currently, we are not mandated. Nobody is forcing us. And we find the vast majority of students we get don't have the uh, time. They don't have the financial resources to invest another one to two years. Not to say that the DMP is not a valued degree because it's an extremely valued degree and it just depends when, where and what you want to do in your nursing career. Other people will disagree with me uh, and say that they feel that the DMP is and the PhD should be entry level into advanced practice nursing. That was going full force 20, uh, 2010 especially. There was a big push that everybody you get to that DMP, 2008 programs were already going. Uh, but now that has, there's been a back away from that. So I'm gonna be a panelist here uh, for just a minute because I have a bit of passion on this issue. Uh, one of the things I mentioned, I really agree with what Steve was saying and I, I think I agree with what Greta is describing as well. Um, one of the things that is an impediment to the future of healthcare is the guild mentality. I talked about that last night. And uh, having treating the profession as a guild where we protect it and we build up walls around it by creating degree creep, which is what I think the word you use, Steve, degree yeah. creep, is uh, an impediment. Um, I think it is better for us to be thinking about how do we hold accountability for a team of people who deliver the care regardless of what their degrees are. It doesn't make any difference what the degrees are. If, if you can do it with a frontline person who's been through a six hour course, so be it from my perspective, if you've if you got the right outcomes. And I think that's one of the problems that we have in medicine today is that we're very trapped in this guild mentality. It, it affects medicine, nursing, pharmacy, all of the professions. And we've really got to get away from that if we're going to be successful because there simply aren't enough degreed people now that's not to suggest that degrees aren't important. I do believe that they have a role, but we shouldn't use them as barriers and hurdles for the delivery of care, which I think is kind of what's, that, that's always occurring. That's been occurring for the last 40 years. This is not a new phenomenon. It's been going on for 40 years. So no, no I'm not a panelist anymore. Um, other questions? I'm sure there's more. Yeah, right here. I don't need more questions. <laughs> um, there's a topic that was brushed up against by the panel, but not explored fully, and, and that topic is rationing. In insurance contracts, care is rationed explicitly. You're told exactly what the c contract covers. You buy or you choose not to buy it. You're told what you won't get and what you will get. There's an explicit rationing there. You then talked about uh, the potential of increasing cost or behavior related um, uh, uh, healthcare problems. That's rationing of a different sort. As the price goes up, people are able to make less choices in the healthcare. I'm okay with that kind of rationing. If, if you're engaging in behavior related cost increasers in healthcare, you should probably be required to make choices of the kind of care you're going to receive and face increased costs for you behaviors you engage in. My concern goes to rationing of a different sort, which may be a product of the healthcare uh, law. And that is, 
at some point, if we don't get to the reimbursement mechanism that uh, Steve Brenton talked about, <laughs> if we don't find a way to pay for episodes of care, and I think everybody thinks that's a long way off, if we don't get there, there will conceivably be insufficient dollars in the healthcare system to fund the care, particularly to seniors, that, 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 that will be a need for in the future. So what about government-related or government-determined rationing, which is very different than the rationing that's going on right now in the marketplace? So, so that's a perspective. Steve. Yeah, you know, one of the reasons, everybody loves the Medicare program. Everybody loves it, and why? Because when you're a senior and you get that Medicare card, you pretty much can go see any physician that you want pretty quickly and have available to you a wide array of services. Now, on the drug side, there's a little bit more consternation because in some cases you have to pay for part of that. But, you know, under the original Medicare program, drugs were really never an issue to begin with. So, but my point is that, um, you know, Medicare is a great program. In fact, many in Congress uh, on the Democrat side of the aisle wanted Medicare for all. You know, why do we even have this commercial insurance business where these guys make money off of commissions you know, by selling uh, insurance products to, uh, to businesses and to, to individuals? You know, the only reason that Medicare works, from my perspective, is that there's a safety net, and it's called private insurance, commercial insurance plan which pay hospitals and physicians significantly higher at higher payment rates than the Medicare program pays. Uh, Medicare for all, if we had Medicare for all anytime soon, you would not begin to see, and, and for some of you that might be not a bad idea, but you would not begin to see the type of health delivery system and access to just about anything that you want tomorrow uh, available because Medicare does not pay the full costs of care provided to uh, that population. It's paid for by the folks that Bob sells insurance to, who pay 120, 130% uh, of costs, while Medicare pays 85, 90% of costs. And you know, my sense, one of the concerns that I had with this legislation, and frankly, I still have it, uh, as it relates to the creation of these insurance exchanges in 2014 is that gradually we will move to a more public system where there will be less and less commercial covered lives and from a provider perspective you know that's going to have a major impact on the ability uh, for you know healthcare jobs are pretty good jobs okay may not be as good as you know some public sector jobs but i'll tell you it's good health care benefits um, family sustaining wages and, and incomes, you know, they are in many communities in the state among the best private sector jobs out there. And, but if, if, if our only payer was Medicare, that would not be the case, I guarantee you. Uh, and the ability of hospitals and physician clinics to add new technology, some of you may believe too quickly, but to be able to uh, add technology that the public wants would be uh, stifled a bit because of that financial situation. And you know, my concern, and I know it gets kind of caught up in the rhetoric uh, for those, some who went well over the top uh, as it relates to opposing this legislation, but uh, the notion of Medicare for all, I think, would lead to rationing indirectly imposed by government uh, because the money would not be there to do the things that people expect. Uh, just by the way, some people think that would be good, that we need really a shock, an awe effect, uh, so that uh, folks realize that um, they can't have everything. So Steve, let, let me I don't think politically, I don't think politically that, that, that's a winning issue. Well, let, me, let me ask you this question though, to, to extend this. So yeah. should we, in the insurance uh, system, allow people to get anything that they want? I mean, is that something that society should do? I mean, that's sort of underlying the question. A little bit. I mean, you know. Uh, but see, I don't know who's going to make those decisions uh -huh. because it's easy for me to say, you know, I don't think that this guy up there needed that 
MRI procedure two days after he twisted his knee playing tennis last Thursday, okay? I could easily say that. It's not my knee, you know? I'm not in pain. Um, but that guy who went in there with his insurance plan, but on Medicare, you could have had three of those MRIs probably in the last 72 hours. Um, I don't know who imposes those kinds of decisions. Uh, I would not want it to be government. I'd rather have it be medical care. I guess the question, I guess the question, Steve, is that are, are all the things that are done at the hospitals and at the institutions that you represent, are all of them necessary and do they really contribute to health or are they done because they generate revenue? Now, I mean, you know, I mean, we have to be Absolutely. Honest. Some of that happens. Yeah, some of that happens. And the question then becomes, what is that percentage and, you know, does it, how are those dollars allocated? Yeah. And who pays for it? And, and that's why I am a strong supporter, although I agree with Greg, it's going to come relatively slowly. I'm a so strong supporter mm -hmm. of evolving to paying for episodes of care, okay. not incidents of okay. care. Okay, okay. Uh, Bob, you had a second. Yeah. Uh, there's a socioeconomic element uh, in the health delivery system. But my concern is that we cannot turn it into a least common denominator basis. Uh, and I think that that is one of the issues that is really being a struggle right now. Do I want to see more governmental regulation? No, I do not. Uh, because I think what, from a governmental perspective, we are moving more and more towards a least common denominator approach to things, which from, a, from an economic perspective isn't sustainable. Uh, when I look down the road here, even on the issue about the exchanges coming up in the near future. I sat on a panel recently in D.C., and there was a gentleman there who was discussing the exchanges and really, that did Obama really get national health insurance as a result of the Health Reform Act? And the idea that employers in the very near future will have a, a decision to make. Will they say, I'm done with health insurance, go to your exchange, here's the money, do what you need to do. From an employer's perspective, a bottom line perspective, my, I would say to my employers, yes, get out of the health insurance business. Why do you want to spend $15,000 a year on, or more on health insurance when you can pay a fine of $2,200 and you're done? Right? In the near term, that's a great economic decision. But in the long term, are the exchanges going to be able to really sustain themselves on that $2,200 penalty? And I think the answer is going to be no. So what we're going to see is, we're going to see the trans transition from private sector to public sector, and then when people start seeing the, the rates go up on the exchanges, now we're going to say, ooh, we've got to do something differently here to contain costs. I want to go back to private sector, and that industry may not be there in its current form. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts on this particular issue? So, oh, question, other questions? Somebody's pointing over this way. Pointing way over this way. Have you seen it? Oh, down here. Got old eyes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to add another dimension here that's a little bit different than what we've been talking about. Um, and the whole idea of teams that you had mentioned and, and working together as teams and, and developing the uh, delivery care system there. And then the added dimension too about the possibility of not being so gilded in the mentality of that, that you have to have a medical person you know, saying something that might be medical to another person. Have, what are the possibilities within your thinking of including people like um, uh, massage therapists, people like uh, uh, healing touch practitioners, people like yoga uh, therapy instructors, people like uh, those people who are part of a team, not necessarily just part of the workforce wellness program. Right now they're pretty much housed in a workforce wellness program, uh, but as part of the quote team that is providing service. Thoughts on that? Yeah, Steve. Yeah, I can I can respond. I think I think alternative medicine um, very well could be part of that team. Um, I, I really don't want government to mandate that alternative medicine be part of that team because that would be an extension of the guild thing. 
but I think successful organizations that are putting together medical homes with teams are going to think about the very issues you've talked about. And they're going to be more successful if they respond to the consumer demand. And, and increasingly, consumers are demanding those kinds of services as part of their overall primary care. You know, I have to add, so I have a few panelists here. Uh, I have to add that uh, I, I have a problem called peripheral neuropathy. And I've got pain in my feet and whatnot. And I went to a pain management center recently. And what was interesting yeah. is that they, they approached me and they said, Kevin, uh, we'd like you to talk to our med meditation therapist. And I said, <laughs> and I'm a family physician. I'm sort of classically trained. And I said, oh, come on. I don't need a meditation therapist. And they said, well, Kevin, we really think this would help you, so we'd like you to try it. So I did. And you know what? It's been amazing. <laughs> I mean, every morning I get up and I do my 15 minutes of meditation, and it, it's helped. Now, I, I have no idea how that has happened. Uh, I mean, as a clinician, as a f classically trained allopathic physician, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but it works. And I'm sort of going with it, and I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't gone to this pain management center and a doctor had said to me, no, no, this is really important. So I think you're right. We don't need to mandate it, but it probably needs to be considered as part of this team effort. And as we go to episodes of care that Steve was talking about, it seems to me that that notion gets built in. That's part of what comes back then full circle to the guilt thing. We should let the care delivery team figure out the best delivery model. So, yeah. I would just concur with everything that's been said, and I think that, you know, I would stretch it even further beyond that. Like, um, you know, a faith community, like peer mentors, like, um, you know, behavior, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, lay health educators. Um, there can be a whole array of people who are part of your team. And I think when you connect uh, culturally with the, the people you're serving, and you're really responsive to what they're asking for, it can be very, very useful. Um, and so, yeah, in some circles, you know, a, a meditation approach would be very natural. In other circumstances, that would seem very, very foreign. But I think it's a matter of being able to make those decisions locally and, and really drive what works for that population and, and for you as an individual. You know, the other thing that's interesting about uh, care deliver alternative care delivery models is that, you know, one of the most powerful care delivery models is peer, peer care. The peers give advice to one another. So, you know, uh, I'm sure we've got some people in the audience that maybe a woman that's had breast cancer. You know when, when women who have breast cancer, do you know when they think about the issue? Two o'clock in the morning. I mean, there's a lot of data that shows this. It's when they're waking up and, they're, and they get online and they share with other people that are awake at two o'clock in the morning and they get peer advice. And that peer advice is actually very powerful for helping women who have breast cancer be able to manage the disease much more effectively than if they just go to the doctor. So there are other alternative models out there that we should be thinking about as well that are sort of out of the mainstream that uh, potentially could be very powerful in, in delivering better quality care. Uh, other questions? Other thoughts? Yeah, over here. We need to get some of the students thinking about questions as well. As I listened to the uh, panelists uh, this morning, theme that has emerged, from my opinion, is that of change. We're dissatisfied with the current system. There has to be a better way. But as I'm thinking about that change model, whatever we adopt, people will make mistakes, despite their best efforts to the contrary. And that sounds negligent. And as I'm thinking about the various issues here, would, what are your thoughts with respect to having caps on the inevitable malpractice that will occur as we go through the change cycle? Good question. Yeah, malpractice has been left off the uh, docket. Uh, I'll be glad to take that one. Um, <laughs> as it relates to the caps, it's, it's a tough call. I mean, I, I see it from both sides. I see it from the perspective of uh, making a reasonable compensation or settlement with an individual who may have had an, a life-altering event and making sure that they are going to be in a position long term to be able to care for themselves and obtain the medical help necessary to manage their life based upon the mistake. Uh, I am strongly in favor 
of caps on attorney's fees. Um, what we have seen over the years uh, is that there, are a, there is a whole host of attorneys, I hate to criticize my own profession, that uh, it's, it's about the money. Okay, it's, it's only about the money. And how much can I maximize based upon the deal? And doctors uh, many times are put in the corner. Uh, I, I'm going to sit there, I'm going to go through and have myself raked over the coals, embarrass the financial care hospital, you know, dragged through the mud, or, you know what, stuff happens. <coughs> a mistake was made. And I, I think we do need to have some sort of tort reform uh, that makes it not a cottage industry where I can you know, buy fancy cars and nice houses uh, at the, at, to the detriment of other individuals. We need to <coughs> take care of the person who is the victim, but not necessarily reward the legal profession with 30 and 40% recoveries. The money's going to the wrong place. That's my opinion. Yeah, Wisconsin currently has uh, caps on non-economic damages of $750,000, and then there are no caps on economic damages, which would be you know, lost future wages, medical expenses, etc. cetera. Uh, I think that is an appropriate number, um, and I think it's an appropriate number because it balances the kind of things that Bob talked about. Um, Attorneys, you know, contingency fees, I'll let you know, somebody else argue their way through that issue. Um, unfortunately, the national legislation did not contain any tort reform, national caps, and that was strictly a political call. I mean, it was a constituency driven political call, right or wrong, I believe it was wrong, um, but that is the fact. Wisconsin is viewed, by the way, nationally as a relatively favorable state for physicians from a tort perspective. Because not only do we have caps on non-economic damages, where in some states they're unlimited, but we also have a patient compensation fund, which acts as a kind of a buffer or a reinsurer for, um, for medical malpractice claims. It's been a very successful, uh, um, and it's you know, part, of the, part of those arrows in the quiver that many of our organizations use when we recruit physicians from other states. Uh, and there are a lot of states that look to Wisconsin, for example, uh, as a relative haven uh, from some of the uh, uh, some of the vagaries of, uh, of medical malpractice uh, tort actions. Uh, let, me, let me extend this discussion a little bit uh, because the, the question, I think, also needs to be asked. Uh, <coughs> tort is a state's issue. And uh, are we at a point, because of a lot of the changes that have occurred in society, where really tort reform should be incorporated at the national level, that it should be a national issue? I mean, there's been that debate, that discussion. So let's, let's start with that question, but I think then that, that extends then to the next issue, which is, are we also at a point where licensure for providers should be also nationalized? You know, I mean, in Australia, when you have a license to practice medicine, you have a license to practice medicine in Australia. It's not by state. Uh, you know, in the United States, you have to get your license in every single state, and they're all different in terms of how they manage it, et cetera. Does that make sense when we've got cross-border practice, et cetera? So I guess they asked the question about, so what is the role of the federal government versus the states on things like tort reform and licensure? Any thoughts on the panel? Yeah, I, I think um, from a federal standpoint, addressing your question on tort reform, um, I'm not sure I want Congress telling me that my wrongly amputated leg is only worth $125,000. No, I'm not suggesting that. Okay. I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting that tort reform as a policy issue should it be a federal so that we have a uniform tort reform approach across the United States versus each state doing its own shtick? Well, where I, Wisconsin does a pretty good job and, you know, Illinois sucks. Here's maybe where it works on a state level. And this works to um, keep down the number of frivolous claims and fraudulent claims. Mm -hmm. When you look at a state like Virginia, um, to sue uh, medical malpractice, Virginia, you have to get through a tribunal before it goes to the level of, um, of what we see in other states as, as uh, you know, 
compliance attendant level. Uh, that tribunal is made up of a physician, a administrative judge, and then an appointee by the, by the executive branch, by the governor. That works on a state level for those claims brought in state court. If all tort claims are brought in federal court, certainly. No, I'm not suggesting that federal things be brought in federal court. I'm suggesting that you could have a policy that says that all states will have a tribunal. If that's a good approach. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, the question I don't know becomes. We can do that from a constitutional <laughs> standpoint. We might have to get back a couple hundred years. <laughs> hey, Kevin, getting into your licensure issue. Yeah. I imagine you're running me have some ideas. I really like the idea, because I'm, I, I, I'm for breaking the gills as much as we can. I really like the idea of common licensure, especially for uh, MDs, nursing, mm -hmm. uh, pharmacists. Wisconsin, and, and we, we work, the uh, hospital association worked hard on this. We actually have a compact between Minnesota and Wisconsin as it relates to nursing. We're still working on the other states. I mean, and, and it's amazing how these licensing boards will oppose this stuff, even though, you know, quite frankly, in 99.9% .9 of the case, you can get that license. You have to jump through a million hoops and pay a lot of money, and in some cases, wait months, you know, to get that license moved from one state to another. Um, so I, uh, I like the idea, and generally I'm a states' rights person, but I like the idea of having a national standard, at least for uh, a lot of the clinical um, type professions that I mentioned. Okay, Greta, what are, what are your thoughts? Um, I'm in actual complete agreement with that, uh, especially looking at the advanced practice role. You know, we are a border state, and um, it, to carry dual licensure as an APRN is, is not real cost effective either. It hinders uh, movement. Uh, many people might live in Illinois and work in Wisconsin, vice versa. Uh, and so I would definitely pull for that. I mean, we have DEA numbers, and those are national, you know, national licensures. And that's, uh, I, I really think there's a lot of advantage to that. Um, and I would totally agree that I think one license would be great. Okay, I'd like to ask the panelists one final question. We've got about five minutes, so we're going to give one minute to each of you uh, to sort of close out here. If there was one thing that you could just do right now, and you could implement it right now, what is that one thing that you would do right now? Brett? I'd like to see states encourage their state run, thank you, I'd like to see states encourage their state run universities to help. Um, maybe the, uh, the, the degree implementation, the accreditation, fight that accreditation a little bit as far as uh, the doctoral programs for, uh, for an MP or a PA, as well as try to provide incentives uh, for more primary care physicians. Okay. Bob? Uh, mine would be back to the wellness programs. Uh, giving employers an, uh, a tool to effectively manage or initiate uh, wellness initiatives in the, in the workplace uh, through the well-defined set of rules and responsibilities to have effective and efficient means of at least beginning changes in behavior and a protocol to help the healthcare system contain cost. Okay, and I'm gonna follow follow that with absolutely it wellness programs, but I I want time with my patients to be able to promote health and not just treat the disease once it's occurred. I'd like to see a doubling of the class size of the University of Wisconsin Medical School as well as the Medical College of Wisconsin's medical schools with 80% of that uh, new capacity being targeted towards uh, primary care medicine. And then with, uh, I'd like to see the provider community step up and contribute dollars to expand residency programs to keep those young students and young doctors in the state of Wisconsin. Okay. I'm going to go a little left field here, but um, I'm going to—I would say that I would really try to eliminate poverty, <laughs> because I think that at the at the core, um, you look at socioeconomic and educational attainment, and if you actually can get those two things, you can get people employed, you can get them off of uh, publicly subsidized programs, and get them engaged in their health care. Um, I think a lot of problems would fall downhill from there. So, so we're stepping in the middle. Very good step. In. So, uh, interesting uh, response by the panelists. What's interesting is that uh, the whole healthcare reform package, as we've all sort of agreed to, is all about insurance reform. And the five uh, things that people would do right now 
don't really relate to insurance reform, except for a little bit of what Greta was talking about in terms of time uh, availability so that you, you, know, you aren't focused on doing things to people. But we have educating primary care providers, we have wellness, we have the time issue of uh, how do I spend my time. Uh, we have you know, increasing the size of, of the medical school and also increasing residencies uh, in primary care and eliminating poverty. Uh, none of those have anything to do with insurance directly, and probably those things would actually improve health care. Not probably. I think they really would. So thank you very much for our panel.